Your Voice Show is a dialogue between the host and the listeners about their relationships. This show is not an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and I have Sean in studio. Now, this is a show about what matters most in our life, our minds, thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. And in this show, I'll bring you the latest research about new research revealing how frequently being the target of workplace bullying not only leads to health-related problems, but can also cause victims to behave badly themselves. And then I will speak to Pamela Asobo and Chang. She's a TV radio host and the editor of Impact, the immigrant, the immigrant magazine. You can call us on the studio line. You can talk to myself, Pamela. We'd love to have you and hear your comments and um, be a part of the show. You can call us at the studio at 951-922-3532. Now, be sure to listen to my podcast also on iTunes and Stitcher. Um, the podcast will be under a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian and share it with your friends. Tell them about it. And um, we'll be right back with the tip of the week. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time-limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the Awareness Integration Model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com. So here's the tip of the week. Now this week, I've been witnessing and working on ways that we belittle ourselves and put ourselves down. I've watched that on my own head, the way I do it to myself, and I've watched it with my clients, with my friends. And I thought, hey, let's talk about it. We all pick up from how our parents supported or scolded us and do the same thing to ourselves, right? We interject their way of being with us 
and treat ourselves exactly the same way, with the same words, with the same connotations, with the same tonality. And uh, usually we'll pick up from both or whomever was our caretaker or even one of the teachers, but mostly our um, the person who really took care of us. Those are the ones we record in our head and that's what we do. So when those learned ways supported us and move us forward, then we can utilize them to our advantage. The problem is when using negative based words, belief systems and sentences that can harm us, they can limit us, they can hold us back. And most importantly, lessens our self-esteem. They'll bring our confidence and self-esteem down and lead us to self-destructive acts. Like you're not worth it. You know, those words that keep coming at us, then we need to claim them useless because obviously they don't do any good for us except um, belittling us, make us feel bad about ourselves, and kind of holds us from really doing the things we need to do. And um, we need to claim them useless and shift our thoughts and beliefs toward more positive and supportive belief systems and words and the ways that we treat ourselves. So begin becoming aware of your thoughts and how positive or negative they are. You can actually journal, journal every day, even at night, and then take a red pen and a blue pen, let's say, okay, and put the blue, all the positive things you said about yourself, kind of put blue around it and all the negative ones pull red around it and see how positive and negative are you. And if you see a lot of red ink around your journaling, maybe, you got to start looking at what are you doing to yourself and start utilizing those and shifting them into a positive one. So become aware of how you treat yourself in your thoughts. Assess whether you are nurturing and you nurture yourself with your thoughts or you constantly scolding yourself one way or another. How nasty, really, how nasty do you get with yourself? And you don't deserve that shouldn't be nasty to yourself. So is there a reason why you need to punish yourself? Then let's find out if you've done anything, anything that you think that it was wrong or it was a mistake. Let's evaluate it. Let's see what was wrong, what lessons you learned from it, what you could do about it now. And if there's a person which you need to clear things with or apologize and then forgive yourself and maybe them and move on. So your clear and positive outlook toward yourself is your clean and clear engine for your day and for your life. So please don't muddy it up with unrealistic and unproductive and at times pretty useless thoughts. All right, go, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with the latest research. Check us out online at KMET1490AM.com. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM dot com. KMET Banning. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujian Zain. You can get it now at fujian.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, 
the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Welcome back to Inner Voice, the heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Now, the new research reveals how frequently being the target of a workplace bullying not only leads to health-related problems, but can also cause victims to behave badly themselves. The study led by the University of East Anglia in collaboration with um, Onintuno, Telematic International University in Italy found that in some cases, this is characterized by the lack of problem solving and high avoidance coping strategies. For example, drinking alcohol when having a problem, experiencing very frequent negative emotions such as anger, fear and sadness, and high work moral disengagement, which refers to the ways that individuals rationalize their actions and absolve themselves of responsibility of their consequences. The bullying is one of the major occupational stresses for employees and the effects can compromise their development and health, as well as interfere with the achievement of both personal and professional goals. It is usually differentiated as work-related, personal-related bullying. So it is either work-related bullying or personal-related bullying. So the former personal uh, I'm sorry, work-related bullying, um, refers to bullying affected workload. For example, removing responsibility and work processes and such attacks on someone's professional status. The personal bullying it refers to both indirect, for example, exclusion and isolation of someone at work and direct negative behaviors such as physical abuse actually at work or yelling at them or belittling them in front of everybody else. So while previous research has shown a link between being the target of bullying and behavioral problems for the first time, this study identifies different configuration of victims by considering not only exposure to and types of uh, bullying, but also health problems and bad behavior. The study also examined how these groups differ in terms of negative emotions experienced in relation to work, coping strategies, and moral disengagement. It was published in the journal Personality and Individual Differences. The study was led by Dr. Roberta Fida, a senior lecturer in the work, psych uh, work of psychology at UEA's Norwich Business School. She says, Overall, our results show the need to consider not only exposure to and types of bullying, but also their associated consequences. In particular, the findings highlights that victimization is associated not only with health problems, but also with a greater likelihood of not behaving in line with the expected social or organizational norms. So the greater the intensity of bullying, at the, and the more the exposure to different types of bullying, the higher the likelihood of engaging in counterproductive workplace behavior. Well, we see that also with children, definitely. I guess we also see it uh, pretty much with adults at work. So furthermore, the results show that health-related symptoms are not always associated with experiences of bullying. While those experiencing limited work-related bullying did not report health problems, those who were not bullied but misbehaved did. So the importance of emotions needs to be considered in HR, human resources, and management intervention policies. So despite the evidence recognizing that the relevance of emotions when dealing with workplace aggression, this is rarely incorporated into guidelines. 
In addition, it is essential to also promote behavioral regulation, strategies to reduce moral disengagement, as well as negative compensating behaviors, such as drinking more alcohol and taking more risks. Its role in allowing otherwise good people to freely engage in conduct they would generally consider wrong, is further confirmed in this study. So the researchers asked 1,019 Italian employees about their experiences of workplace bullying, counterproductive behavior, and health symptoms. They were also asked about their coping strategies and negative emotions experienced at work and moral disengagement. So five groups were identified, one of which includes victims who are uh, the target of work-related bullying and frequently exposed to personal related bullying who experience high health problems and misbehavior. Another group experienced work-related bullying but less frequent personal related bullying and show lower health problems and misbehavior. Although they generally use problem-solving strategies, they tend to be overwhelmed by the negative emotions they experience and are not able to control them. They also have a tendency to morally disengage. A third group have limited exposure to work-related bullying and no exposure to personal related bullying while not experiencing health-related problems. They sometimes engage in counterproductive work behavior. A fourth group includes those who are not bullied but have high health-related symptoms, and some behavior. The last group identified are not exposed to any bullying, have no health symptoms or behavioral problems. Examination, having a lot of sound here, I don't know why. Examination of the groups in relation to individual dimensions highlighted the pivotal role of negative emotions and emotional regulation, independently from exposure to workplace bullying, in more severe cases, moral disengagement and compensatory behavior play. Okay. All right. so, so, so I'm hearing, I think our guest is with us while we're actually going through. Um, okay, so got it. Now we're back. So in more severe cases, moral disengagement and compensatory behavior play an equally important role, suggesting the weakening of individuals' ability to regulate their behavior. So you, there is a lot of bullying at work. Um, there's a lot of mismanagement. The bullying can happen from peers or it could actually happen from bosses. And um, what it has done, it's a, it puts a lot of pressure on people, especially people who are not able at any point to quit. They need their jobs, they need the money they get. And um, it affects them in every aspect of their life. And they do. The stress that goes that they take it home, they do risky behavior um, between they in order to re release their pressure. And they actually bring it home and um, it affects their family system. So it's important to be able to do that and figure it out. All right. I think we're going to have our guest. I'm excited to have Pamela Soba and Chang. She's a... TV radio host and the editor of Impact, the immigrant magazine. She created the immigrant magazine online in 2003 as a medium to publish her article and provide informative resources to immigrants. In 2004, she started a free print publication that grew from four to 60 pages. In 2013, for greater national circulation, the print magazine morphed into a daily weblog and weekly E newsletter. This platform is currently being transformed into an online TV network that will aggregate and distribute compelling digital content about immigrants in the U.S. Now, her magazine has served companies and institutions such as Walt Disney, the City of Los Angeles, AIDS Walk New York and LA, the Hollywood Carnival, MoneyGram International, Los Angeles Metro, and multiple small businesses famous ethnic film festivals, and multicultural events in Los Angeles for outreach to immigrant communities. Today, Pamela is the creator and the host of Impact with Pamela and Chang on KPFK, Pacifica Radio for Los Angeles, Southern California, and the world. Impact is not only a radio show, but also a televised show whose mission is to bridge and bring America together. 
through storytelling and meaningful dialogue with one another. The televised version would be distributed on the Immigrant Magazine's YouTube channel, Tim TV Voice of Immigrants in America. Pamela is an ardent advocate for human, human, humane immigration reform and the movement to restore and the misplaced dignity of immigrants. She has been cro um, chronicled by the Los Angeles Times, NPR, the Africa Channel, Voice of America, and many ethnic immigrant organizations, political leaders, immigrant advocates, and influencers recognize the Immigrant Magazine as the legitimate, inclusive voice of immigrant. Welcome to my show, Pamela. My, 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 Dr. Fujian, mouthful about me right there. I'm so flattered. Thank you. <laughs> and yes, you are. You're amazing. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really sorry about the mishap, the technical difficulties on this day, but I'm so glad to finally be able to connect. <laughs> yes, yes. It's awesome to have you. have been waiting for this day for a long time. Yes. So um, obviously there were a record 43.7 million immigrants who are now living in um, the U.S. And this, and this was from 2016, and it's probably going higher now, making up about 13.5% of the nation's population. This represents a more than fourfold increase since 1960s, when it was probably about 9.7 million immigrants. Um, these are all immigrants who came, um, who are born outside of the United States and now live here. And this is the group that you represent and the Immigrant Magazine represents this group. So tell us about you and how you got to all of this. Absolutely. Can you hear me, Dr. Fujan? I do. Oh, really? And I'm here struggling. <laughs> I want to just power it out right now. Thank you so much. Well, well, thank you for having me, first of all. My journey really begins over 20-something years ago. I've been in the United States for about 25 years. And this journey, I can tell you, started right then. If I had come to this country and found, let's say, a medium or media platform or resources that would have helped me, you know, integrate, acculturize, I think I would have been way ahead of the game. And so out of that frustration, in um, 19... Um, 90, right around after I had my first child, I started feeling an urge to write about my experiences. And um, is that you calling me? No, no, I think you need to, no. Okay, I'll just put this away then. <laughs> well, the beauty of live television, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. We're, and, we're doing it all right in front of everybody, all. all of our audience, all of our viewers. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah, so I had this urge and I was writing all these articles about my experiences and how challenging it was being an immigrant. I wanted to write about my experiences as an African, growing up in Africa in Cameroon where I'm born, and I had no platform to express those ideas. And so I started writing articles about myself. And... Um, started talking to others and found out that we shared similar experiences. I went to grocery stores. I found out immigrants did kind of migrate to certain areas. And if you're an immigrant, you want a certain kind of food, some kind of, uh, you know, delicacy, you go to certain places. And so when we'd meet, they would feel this camaraderie around us and just felt like home. And then it didn't matter if I was from Africa and someone was from Russia or someone was from Iran. We just had that thing about that immigrant experience where we felt like the outsider and we connected and it felt, you know, it felt homely. And so I started, you know, I put out queries and I had lots of, you know, publicists send me articles about their CEOs of companies wanting to share that story. And so I found out that no matter how successful people became, they wanted to tell people their journey. They wanted to share their stories. And so that's how the platform began online, actually, like you rightly said, I started putting these articles. So someone is so successful, but when you listen to mainstream media, the story is about, you know, how they've created this great invention and never really told the story of the journey and how this person came from Russia or from Nigeria or from Ghana or from Iran or Iraq or, you know, Palestine. Nobody talked about that aspect. And these people had a yearning for that. And they wanted to tell these stories. And so I started telling those stories. And next thing I know, LA Times is knocking on my door saying, hey, you seem to have the pulse of the immigrant community. 
<laughs> and I was like, really? <laughs> and so it became a thing. And I found out there was a need for a platform immigrants wanted to reconcile and wanted to be heard. And now look at where we are today. If you look at the state of the country and, you know, there's more talk about immigration. Yes. There's more dialogue about immigrants. And now it became a challenge for me even. Was I going to talk about legal immigration? Or was I going to talk about, you know, everything? And it was really something I was wrestling with because I just wanted to share success stories. But then it became something bigger than I anticipated. And so yes. I found myself an advocate. <laughs> Yes, I mean, it uh, It started apparently from um, a human place where uh, the need and the desire to be seen and known um, and then a shared experience is to be together because I think each group that have come to the United States have kind of uh, gravitated to each other first. So they'll create this type of um, communities around, like you'll see the Chinatown or Japantown or Koreatown yes. or, you know, in Los Angeles, we have the Persian Square and the Westwood area. And you have all of these areas where you can go and really see the culture. You see the writings all over the street. You see the food uh, and the cultural pieces that are there. And, um, and your magazine kind of creates this encompassing concept that also shows um, how, yes, unique we are, but how much similar um, it is when you go to another country and you're trying to acculturate and assimilate regardless of where you come from. So it's this beauty of how do you keep your own culture and then how do you also kind of acculturate and, and sometimes assimilate, if you choose to, yes. into the bigger culture um, here. And you're absolutely right, going from just life stories, now it has really changed in the media to a lot of political conversations and, Absolutely. you know, um, where there was this open hand of immigrants coming in here and building the country together. Now you also see this kind of at times like the anger that shows up when conversing about immigrants. Um, so that you could, uh, this past 25 years, you've probably seen the shift of- Absolutely welcoming to like, I don't know. I don't know if I want this, you know? So it's very interesting. I came here when about 40 years ago, I was 12 yeah. when I came from Iran and I've watched so many different experiences, Pamela, especially because of the country I came from. Yeah. So I've come from a place where, you know, oh my God, you guys are part of royalty and, you know, what an amazing place to, then it was the, um, you know, hostage taking. So we were all bad and uh, really uh, nasty. And then we became great again. And then, you know, mm -hmm. other people did the terrorism, but they put it on us. And now... Oh. Now we're, you know, Iran is really on the on the cusp of uh, a lot of political conversation and fears are there again. So um, tell me about what you have experienced this past 25 years of watching not only yourself, but also being part of the story of the immigrants in the United States. You know, that could take a week, <laughs> but let's start somewhere. Actually, you know, the first thing I noticed is, for like I said, the desire for immigrants to be acknowledged. Immigrants want their voices heard. And there's a sort of a feeling of hypocrisy almost that immigrants feel because we feel that this country's foundation is immigration. And so what is it that makes us still feel like outsiders? You know, there's that feeling, there's that hankering to want to be acknowledged, especially when you take into consideration the fact that Immigrants have built these countries. Innovation. If you look at every invention, if you think about the contributions, if you look at, um, uh, think even about food, the cultural implications, the influences that immigrants have had. You think about technology. If you look at Google, Yahoo, name it. Immigrants have a footprint in everything that you see. And yet, we feel like we don't belong. And that's something that just gnaws on my heart because why should I have to feel this way when immigrants, if you think about the fact that most small businesses or most businesses in this country, 90%, I can say confidently, are half immigrant founders. And so immigrants are creating the opportunities. Immigrants are creating the jobs. Even the immigrants who are not legal, undocumented, are contributing something. So my experiences have been 
good and bad. I can say that because on a positive note, I'm grateful for the opportunity this country has accorded me because I come from a country like probably like you said, we all come from, most of us come from strife. Very few people, very few immigrants come from, you know, oh, I was comfortable back home and I just wanted to come to the United States. <laughs> you know, most of us are coming from some kind of lack, either political persecution, um, education, maybe pursuit of a higher education, um, fleeing, even hazards, natural disasters, and war, and um, political strife. So I come from that background, almost all of the above. I come from that. And now I'm in this country, and I'm feeling like oh, I'm grateful. This country is giving me the opportunity to live a dream. I love the fact that it gives immigrants the opportunity to live that dream. But there is that part of us that says we are not wanted. <laughs> and nobody wants to acknowledge our contributions. Look at what you are doing, Dr. Foja. Mm -hmm. Look at you. Look at the success. Why can't we celebrate that? And so I wanted to create a platform where we can actually showcase that because I feel that the reason why we don't feel this way is because when you tune to mainstream media, that conversation about immigration, it's never about what you're doing, what I'm doing, what, the, what you know, even Einstein did, <laughs> or what Madeleine Albright did, or whatever, think of any famous immigrants, what, um, name it, the immigrants, the founders of Yahoo, Google, all these people, nobody's talking about what they've done. It's always about, oh, the immigrants are invading us. It's an invasion. Oh, they're the murderers. Oh, they're this and all the negative stuff that I, and the words that are, the choice words that have been used to describe immigrants. And not all Americans feel that way, but because the main story and the narrative is always on that negative tone, the lay American, and I don't want to blame them because if they're not fed information, they don't know. So my responsibility and your responsibility is to make them see that other side. And so I take this as a responsibility to create this platform, to create an enterprise that celebrates immigrants, that tells the stories. And that's why my latest work, which is the Impact Show, the TV and radio show, is not just immigrants. It wouldn't be about you and I just talking. It will be you, me, and sometimes we have an American perspective because we want to balance that conversation. We want him to hear that other side that they don't get to hear. So we want to be inclusive. So, but it's from the immigrant perspective. It's like hear us. You but know, I'm also going to talk I'm, about. So we talk about ourselves. I'm also hearing when you say uh, when you say American just meaning that uh, firstborn and first generation and second generation, so cool. because yes. as you said, exactly everybody uh, in a sense, except um, native, you know, native Americans, everyone else has been from a, a country. So there were uh, searches of somebody coming from Ireland or Italy or different types of places um, and um, different times, uh, the doors open to different groups. Absolutely. that they could come in because of some sort of a need. And I do agree with you that there's a distinct difference about uh, people coming, and I know in 1960s, the amount of people who came from Europe, Northern Europe, were higher uh, percentage than any other um, uh, countries that they came in. And now that has kind of like balanced and it's less, and you, yes. we have more of South America and then Africa and then Middle East. And, um, and the, you know, the ratios have really changed based on yes. the pure research that talks about it. But there's also a different aspect, as you said, when um, a group comes from a country at that moment, then life is okay and life is pretty well. And people do go for a creation of a better life yes. um, to another country or wanting to be with their relatives and all of that. Or coming from a country that at that moment life is not and um, there's a different cause that they come in and sometimes they come in in uh, with force and sometimes they come in in the crowd because of the scenario of you know geopolitical issue that is happening. And it seems like this past couple of years both in Northern Europe and the United States have um, gotten the concept of the surge or the amount of people right at the same time that needed to be placed, yes. uh, which was different than just normal um, ratio of how many people come in to, to the country through the appropriate legal uh, ways that they came in. And this kind of a fear factor that suddenly showed up as if, what are we going to do? What's going to happen to all of our, re 
resources. Yeah. Um, and are they going to take all of our jobs and are they going to take all of our, you know, the, the country's money and resources and what are we going to do? And that fear showed up. And then what you call Americans who are just the second or third or fourth um, uh, generations of immigrants themselves, um, have a different reaction now. And I can definitely get Pamela that, um, people need some sort of a structure. And when that structure is somehow broken, the fear shows up and I get that. And it, but, but it's important that look at the structure and how to create that versus creating a stigma about immigrants or the population that's coming. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the stigma is the problem. And that's why I say, and I think the stigma has been created by the powers that be, whether it's the media or the people in office. Because the, I think human beings are intrinsically great. Well, that would be you to tell me more about the human spirit, right? But whatever information we're nurtured with is what we regurgitate. And I feel that that has been, that's what's been expressed because if you think about the fact that we have all interacted with natural born first generation Americans, right? Like my children, for example, and they generally are not biased or prejudiced until somebody instills that in, de in them. And so now the notion that um, immigrants are coming in to take the jobs, I can tell you this, from all the interviews I've done and all the stories I've written or edited, we're talking about hard working people who actually create jobs. Imagine a day without immigrants in this country. Imagine a day without the, the people that will pick the farmers, those that will pick the strawberries. Now I come from Cameroon. I tell you what, I am not so strong. I couldn't pick a strawberry because, <laughs> you know, but I do know people that are good at picking strawberries and they're immigrants. Likewise, I know a, mil a ton of immigrants who are good at creative mind, those that are nurses, they're in the industries, even in entertainment that are entertaining us. So I'm begging Americans really to open their minds. There is more than enough, I think. There is more than enough in this country to go around. And immigrants, when we come here, I'm not gonna say that you shouldn't have, you shouldn't be weary. Like you said, there's got to be structure. And I would also argue that, give them a chance. Give those who are here a chance. I just had on my last show, a young woman, who as, she's as intelligent as they come, she's undocumented. But if you could just see how much she's accomplished in spite of the fact of the psychological impact of being undocumented, came here as a child brought here by her mother. No responsibility on her, it's not her fault. Managed to go to school, she's a graduate of UCLA, okay? Now, if you put a child through college, <laughs> then you know what I'm talking about. First of all, just to get into these colleges, it's you have to be of a certain girth, a certain caliber of student. And she managed to do that. And today she is doing amazing work as an advocate for immigrants. Without, without, without their parents actually paying millions of dollars to put them in there. You can say that again. <laughs> well, you know, immigrants, we can afford that. <laughs> We're barely trying to make it. My kids, I'll tell you all the time. Listen, I have no savings for you. you. You have to do create wealth for yourself. But I'll give you the opportunity by the fact that I you're born here because I could have had you in Cameroon. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, I have a story that I remember in 1981. I came from Arizona um, to Los Angeles, and the, one of the first jobs that I got, um, I was like 20 years old. I first job that I got was in a lighting manufacturing, and I was. Uh, in the um, accounting department. I got a job in the accounting department. So the, the offices were right in front of the factory in the back. And most everybody, even in the office, were immigrants from different countries, yeah. um, Asians and, um, you know, all different countries. And actually, I think the president of that was also Iranian. And they were all, uh, were all mixed of everyone. And what was interesting, um, Pamela, is like a lot of the workers were Hispanic. Some were documented and some died. And this was Carter's era. And I remember one morning uh, a, a van came, three vans came in and they ran in. Oh. 
and um, they went and raided this mm -hmm. manufacturing area and they were standing there with you know guns looking at us and uh, they will keep asking and I guess because I, I was a little bit more of a light complexion they didn't yes. even ask me anything this is how like it's interesting no yeah. they didn't even ask me I'm from Iran they didn't even <laughs> ask me uh, they didn't ask the Asians. They didn't ask anybody in the office. In a sense, they did go, um, but they were really looking for Hispanics. It was just that it wasn't about anybody else except Hispanics. So they went in. Some of the workers actually went and uh, got themselves into these huge paint containers, and they got toxic, and some of them died in there. Oh. And the rest of them, oh. anybody they could, they would put them in the. Uh, it was really a, a really uh, traumatizing kind of a raid. They put them in the. Uh, vans and they took them and uh, obviously they find the manufacturer and they ask them that they have to have um, Americans mostly and then yet also documented and what was interesting enough for a whole week where the ads were going in order for them to get uh, you know, people to come and uh, get those jobs, they really couldn't. Like only 10% of those jobs were able to be filled and they weren't able to fill them with other um, other people. So, uh, you know, they had to come up with a new ways of bringing, they actually brought the same people back with a new way of creating, you know, immigration and visas and, uh, and work permits for them. But it was interesting that uh, two pieces, yes, I think, you know, Companies do have to handle things legally in order to make um, to create these jobs also for anyone and offer them to people who are here first um, and then, you know, create some other senses. But also, I think that it's important for what you like what you said is also value and not make the people bad. The structures are not working. The in yes. you know the 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 way that the system have been put in place is not working. But let's not in a society take each other for granted and put each other down. We're all human beings. We're all needing to yes. work, gain money, have a food, and you know have a shelter. And I love it that people are working. At least they're working. They're trying yes. to do something, yeah. create something for themselves, and it's sad for us to put each other down because of the desire to work to work who would have thought the desire to work and think about it if every single american family excluding the native americans came from that strife whether it's the italians the irish name it they all came from that strife they're running away from something poverty persecution name it we all come from that background. And where most first, most immigrants are right now is where your forefathers were, you know? And I'm just asking for humane treatment of immigrants when you think about it. That's all we're asking, talk about the stigma. You know, just to treat them humanely. We're in a situation where, like you just said, the jobs, the positions weren't filled. I just said I couldn't pick a strawberry, but you know what, I certainly can write, <laughs> you know? And there are others that have different skill sets mm -hmm. and they're filling in jobs that typically the natural born American couldn't do or does not want to do. And most of us are creating opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so why not then be humane, treat them humanely and give everybody the opportunity. Now, if you're a criminal, that's a different story. I'm not here advocating for criminals. If you've had the opportunity to come to this country, seeking the same opportunities that you and I are seeking, and you decide to follow a different path. Now, that's another story, but let's not take that and put that as, you know, the reason why everybody else should be cast into the same category of criminalization, because they are not criminals. Immigrants are here to work and contribute to the society. So when I'm seeing children whose parents are being deported, now, Dr. Fujian, you tell me, you're the psychotherapist, if I get you right. Mm -hmm. Think about how the destruction that it creates in the family dynamic. Mm -hmm. If you don't want criminals and you take away the father, the breadwinners out of the house, the households, what is to become of these children who are going to grow to become adults? And most of these children, by the way, are now born, <laughs> they're first generation Americans. Yeah. So then you're going to leave these children without parenting, without providers, without any kind of resources for them to become productive 
future American citizens. Well, they have to raise themselves on the street. Mm -hmm. That's what they have to do. And they yeah. have to get street smart. And when you have to get street smart, you know, you, you kind of like are raised uh, being traumatized consistently. And, and those are happens? part of the mental yeah. health issues we have. And then now what happens to those children if they're not fortunate, if nobody gives them that support, the parents are being deported. I'm just thinking like, yes, laws are meant to be there, I think laws are there. Laws are there to guide us, but we can amend laws to accommodate human experiences. That's just what I think. So, I mean, there's been a push for comprehensive immigration re reform for years and years and years. And I'm just sick, and I'm sure you are, of politicians using immigrants and immigration as a, a pawn. You know, it's time to take him, you know, politics out of it and do the humane thing. I'm not going to sit here and say I'm advocating for this political party or this and that, but I think it's time for immigrants to have a voice, to have us take in this conversation. We have 2020 elections coming up, mm -hmm. and I'm looking forward to everyone that's running for office. We need to get to a place as an immigrant, as a bloc, mm -hmm. whose vote will be courted. What do you think? <laughs> well, d there's a conversation about, um, I think. I think that, one of the things that also gets confused, which people just won't know uh, when you are seeing someone, if the person is an immigrant or their first generation or um, that they're immigrants who have become citizens. Yes. You know, we have a lot of immigrants that oh, have yeah. become citizens. And for the first time after almost 40 years that I've been in the U.S., and again, I come from a country which is, has been very controversial with being in the U.S. Like I was, you know, in ASU, Arizona State University, when the hostage taking was, and they were coming, they, pour, they killed Iranians, they poured paint on them, they stabbed them, they, you know, there was a lot of violence at that time. And I could, I won't understand it, but I could see where the, you know, where all that hardship was coming and violence was coming. But after that, to be honest with you, Pamela, I hadn't really seen this with immigrant, immigrant population until recently again, where no. I saw, um, I was at a, a airline and, um, this gentleman just got up and started yelling and screaming at, um, you know, group of Asian people who were speaking their language and they were just getting off the plane, not knowing whether these people were first generation or they were citizens or they had, you know, or they were residents or they were legal or illegal. That didn't matter. No. Now it's this concept of if you are not speaking English and you're not, you know, a white American, yes. um, then, you know, you're automatically uh, an immigrant. And that to me is also a kind of a stigma that is just part of the game that is this showing up, which is not accurate. And it's more like, I really love to talk about these things just to give knowledge of what you said. Most of the, uh, you know, most of the startup companies, most of the ways that people are utilizing the internet they all have been created by people who came in as immigrants, and now they're all citizens of the United States. They're as American as anybody else can be. I've, you know, I came when I was 12. I only spent 12 years in the country I was born. All of yeah, my I, life, I've been here. You've been here. You are as American as <laughs> yes. a child that was born here. Yes, I'm, I'm 58 years old. Like you're just, here. You were raised here. Yes, Tell me about it. You know what? And you're right, Dr. Fujian, because it looks like we're we're past even the immigration issue now. It's more of a racial issue and how you look, and that's really, really very dangerous because it's like this fear of immigrants has transcended into a space where people are afraid that the certain immigrants are overtaking what they feel that America ought to look like. Yeah. And so even our children who are born here are in trouble, are in a crisis, because there's fear. There is a xenophobia that's going on, I have to say it. And uh, I don't know how this is going to be resolved, but you know what, by giving platforms like what you have done, what you're doing, and what I'm doing, and, I'm, I'm, and we urge many other people who have platforms, we need to start standing up and letting that voice be heard. Immigrant yes. voices really need to be heard and to for, to humanize because maybe there is no, not enough humanizing of who the immigrant is. People see us as the word immigrant, right? They're not seeing the person. I 
and yet you know if you think about it, if you have a friend a natural born american or caucasian friend and you have built this relationship with with such and such a person you could get along but you might be surprised to see how they might treat someone else exactly <laughs> you know exactly. it's I really remember. interesting Pamela, the time um, that I was talking to you about the 79 and 80s uh, where the hostage taking was, there are a lot of people who out of fear uh, had to say that I'm from somewhere else. And even when I look at it, you know, genetically, I'm more Caucasian than many of the Americans are there because genetically Iranians are, you know, uh, the race that is more Caucasian than anybody else. That's true. But uh, and I can get away, I'm, you know, white enough to be able to get away with that. But it's like, why would you want to create something why? of a fear where you have why? to fake who you are? And I can fake who I am and I don't choose to, but you wouldn't be able to. A, a lot of other people wouldn't be able to. Asians wouldn't be able to. You know, Middle Easterns wouldn't be able to. And Africans would be like that. Anyway. Thank you. Exactly. Like, why would you want to create a system that you actually together, we have to take away our uniqueness and uh, conform to a thing that we're just not. And it's all becomes a fake concept. So I really hope that we start really respecting each other about the uniqueness that we each are, because that's that's the beauty of being on Earth. That is the beauty of being on Earth. And uh, what is even sadder is the fact that when you think about it, those minority communities that we're talking about are the actual, the, the hardworking, you know, I mean, think about it, because they're the ones that come from so much strife. I know someone that came from some African country and I found the, got the first job working at a retail store and it was so hard working and the, 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 the colleagues were like, oh, you work so hard. And this person is kind of like, oh, <laughs> you only knew where I come from. This is no work. You know, they come with that zeal and enthusiasm and they want to work. Yes. And to have to be stigmatized or, you know, criticized and judged and, and marginalized, it's, it's really sad. It's really sad. And uh, we need leadership that will really see this as an important aspect of the beauty of the American experience because a day without immigrants would be sad. You have one minute to give your uh, final um, message to my audience and everybody who's watching us or listening to us. Oh, this has just been an amazing experience. I just enjoyed having this conversation with you. What I want to tell your audience is to recognize if you're an immigrant, please walk with your head high, up high. Mm -hmm. And if you're an American, please be more open-minded and receptive to the immigrant experiences because they bring nothing but joy. And if you want to find out more about what we're talking about, you can check out my show on www.immigrantmagazine.com and you can tune in on Sundays on Impact at 1 p.m. on KPFK. And of course, Tim TV, Voice of Immigrants, where I have these amazing interviews that you can be sure to get to learn more about immigrants. And Dr. Fujian, you're doing an amazing job. So thank you for having me. Thank you. It was a joy to have you. For everyone who's listening and watching us, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. Until next week, bye-bye. The proceeding...